serial killers have fascinated and horrified people for decades, and Robert Berdella, John Armstrong, and Jerry Prudos are no exception. In this video, we delve into the twisted minds of these three notorious killers and explore the heinous crimes they committed. Before starting, we pray for forgiveness and mercy for all the victims. It is good to remember them in your prayers. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And hit the like button if the video deserves it. Let's continue now. Jerry Prudos Prudos was born on January 31, 1939 in Webster, South Dakota, as the youngest of two sons. During his childhood, he was constantly abused by his mother due to the fact that she always wanted a girl, and was displeased that she had another son instead. Prudos' fetish for women's shoes began when he was only five years old, after he played with spike-heeled shoes at a junkyard. Prudos later claimed that he attempted to steal his first grade teacher's shoes. Besides having a fetish for women's shoes, he had also a fetish for women's underwear, which resulted in him stealing his female neighbor's underwear. As a teenager, he was a patient at many mental hospitals, receiving psychotherapy from them. He would also stalk local women, knocking down or choking them into unconsciousness, and fleeing with their shoes. When he was 17, he abducted and beat a young woman, threatening to stab her if she did not follow his sexual commands. Prudos was arrested shortly after and taken to a psychiatric ward for nine months. There, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and extreme misogyny. Despite being institutionalized, Prudos managed to graduate from high school in 1957 and became an electronics technician. For years later, he married a 17-year-old girl and had two children with her. They both lived together in a suburb in Salem, Oregon. Prudos would force his wife to do housework naked except for a pair of high heels while he took pictures. Sometime later, Prudos began complaining of suffering from migraine headaches and blackouts. To relieve the symptoms, he would steal shoes and lace undergarments during night prowling raids. He kept all the stolen objects, and for a time, the bodies of his future victims, in a garage that he would now allow his wife to enter without announcing her arrival on an intercom. In 1967, Prudos followed a woman to her home because he liked her shoes. He then broke into her house while she was asleep and raped her before strangling her to the point of unconsciousness, then left with some of her shoes. On January 26, 1968, Prudos killed a girl named Linda Slauson when she was selling encyclopedias in the Portland neighborhood where Prudos lived with his wife and children. He approached her and pretended to be interested in buying a set of books. Once she lowered her guard, he subdued her by bludgeoning her, before strangling her to death. After killing her, he threw her body into the Willamette River from the Wilsonville Bridge on Interstate 5, and her body was never found afterwards. Several months later, Jan Whitney was driving home from a Thanksgiving feast when her car broke down, leaving her stranded on the road. Driving down the same road, Prudos spotted her and pulled over to offer assistance, but strangled her instead and engaged in necrophilia with her body. Her car was later found abandoned at a rest stop along Interstate 5 between Salem and Albany, while her body was found tied to a piece of railroad iron on July 27, 1969. Next year, Prudos abducted Karen Sprinker from the parking lot of the downtown Meyer and Frank business and took her to his home, where he raped and killed her. Her body was found on May 12th in the Long Tom River near Monroe. A month later, Prudos attempted to abduct another girl, Gloria Smith but she managed to escape from him. A day later, he abducted Linda Sally from a Lloyd Center parking lot in Portland and killed her. Her body was found in the same river that Sprinker had been found in. After a tip from an Oregon State University student, Prudos was identified as a suspect in the murders and his house was searched. Inside, police found copper wire, rope, and pictures of his victims. Prudos was subsequently arrested and identified as the man who attempted to abduct Gloria Smith. He was charged with three counts of murder and pleaded guilty three days before the scheduled start of the trial. After being given three life sentences, he was transferred to the Oregon State Penitentiary. Prudos died of liver cancer on March 28, 2006 at 5.10 a.m. He was 67 at the time. Robert Berdella 
Robert Berdella was one of the most brutal serial killers in U.S. history who participated in despicable acts of sexual torture and murder in Kansas City, Missouri, between 1984 and 1987. Berdella was born in 1949 in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. The Berdella family was Catholic, but Robert left the church when he was in his teens. Berdella proved to be a good student, despite suffering from severe nearsightedness. To see, he had to wear thick glasses, which made him vulnerable to being bullied by his peers. His father was 39 years old when he died from a heart attack. Berdella was 16 years old. Not long afterward, his mother remarried. Berdella did little to hide his anger and resentment towards his mother and stepfather. In 1967, Berdella decided to become a professor and enrolled in the Kansas City Art Institute. He quickly decided on a change of careers and studied to be a chef. It was during this time that his fantasies about torture and murder began to fester. He got some relief by torturing animals, but only for a short time. At age 19, he got into selling drugs and drinking a lot of alcohol. He was arrested for possession of LSD and marijuana, but the charges did not stick. He was asked to leave college in his second year after murdering a dog for the sake of art. For a few afterward, he worked as a chef, but quit and opened his store called Bob's Bazaar Bazaar in Kansas City, Missouri. The store specialized in novelty items that appealed to those with darker and occult-type taste. Around the neighborhood, he was considered odd but was liked and participated in organizing a local community crime watch programs. However, inside his home, it was discovered that Robert Bob Berdella lived in a world dominated by sadomasochistic enslavement, murder, and barbarous torture. On April 2, 1988, a neighbor found a young man on his porch clad in only a dog collar fastened around his neck. The man told the neighbor an incredible tale of torturous sexual abuse that he had endured at the hands of Berdella. The police placed Berdella in custody and searched his home where 357 photographs of victims in various positions of torture were recovered. Also found were torture devices, occult literature, ritual robes, human skulls and bones, and a human head in Berdella's yard. By April 4 the authorities had an overwhelming amount of evidence to charge Berdella on seven counts of sodomy, one count of felonious restraint, and one account of first-degree assault. After closer scrutiny of the photographs, it was discovered that six of the 23 men identified were homicide victims. The other people in the pictures were there voluntarily and participated in sadomasochistic activities with the victims. Berdella established the rules of the house which were mandatory for his victims or they risked being beaten or receiving bolts of electric shock on sensitive areas of their bodies. In a detailed diary that Berdella kept, he logged details and the effects of the torture he would subject upon his victims. He seemed to have a fascination with injecting drugs, bleach, and other caustics into the eyes and throats of his victims then anally raped or inserted foreign objects inside of them. On December 19, 1988, Berdella pled guilty to one count of first and to an additional four counts of second-degree murder for the deaths of other victims. There were attempts by various media organizations to try to connect the crimes of Berdella to the idea of a national underground satanic group but the investigators responded that over 550 people were interviewed and at no point was there any indication that the crimes were connected to a satanic ritual or group. Berdella received life in prison where he died of a heart attack in 1992 soon after writing a letter to his minister claiming that the prison officials refused to give him his heart medication. His death was never investigated. John Eric Armstrong was a 300-pound, former U.S. Navy sailor, who was known for being mild-mannered and who had an innocent childlike look, so much so, that while in the Navy he was nicknamed Opie by his mates. Armstrong joined the Navy in 1992 when he was 18 years old. He served seven years on the Nimitz aircraft carrier. During his time in the Navy, he received four promotions and earned two good conduct medals. When he left the Navy in 1999, he and his wife moved to Dearborn Heights, a working-class neighborhood in Michigan. He got a job with Target retail stores and later with the Detroit Metropolitan Airport refueling airplanes. Those who lived around the Armstrongs thought of John as a good neighbor and stand-up guy who was a committed husband and devoted father to his 14-month-old son. On January 2, 2000, 
a woman's partially clothed body was pulled from the Rouge River in Dearborn Heights. That ended up being the final case that caused John Eric Armstrong's killing spree to finally end. Armstrong was living in Dearborn Heights at the time of his arrest a few months after the body was found. At the time of his arrest, he was 26 years old and had a young child, with another on the way. Armstrong's spree had stretched several years, and across the globe, as he used his position as a sailor in the Navy to kill between 5 and 18 women. The true total was never conclusive, as investigators couldn't confirm all of the deaths. Now 22 years later, Armstrong is the last serial killer in the Metro Detroit region to be convicted. He's being featured in a series called Twisted Killers, which airs on the Oxygen Channel at 9 p.m. on Thursdays. The intent was to either harm her, kill her, or dispose of her body, Don Riley, a retired Dearborn Heights PD detective sergeant, said in the show. At the scene, the victim's hands were wrapped in plastic to preserve possible DNA evidence and police spoke with the man who reported the body. He claimed he stumbled upon it when he fell out while driving and stopped his car to vomit. Armstrong was the man who notified the police of the body. The story was plausible, although the witness was squirrely, said Elizabeth Walker, retired Wayne County assistant prosecutor. After being interviewed by police, he was released. On January 3, 2000, an autopsy showed that the victim had been strangled. A rape kit was performed. Fingerprints revealed her identity as Wendy Jordan, 39, who'd been arrested previously for soliciting charges in Detroit. Leads dried up and investigators hoped rape kit results would push the case forward. In 2000, that took several months, said Riley. On April 10, 2000, members of the Violent Crimes Task Force in Detroit received word of a homicide near railroad tracks. In all they found three bodies near the railroad tracks. All three had prior arrests for prostitution, like the victim found in Dearborn Heights. Armstrong's killings took place between 1992 and 1999. The search for the murderer intensified and the Sex Crimes Unit and the Homicide Unit joined the case. Our concern was serial killers, said Jerry Cliff, former commanding officer for the Detroit Police Department. They tend to escalate so we need to get this guy off the street now. This guy's a killing machine. Detectives thought they caught a break when they found a coat near one of the victim's bodies with prescription pill bottles in a pocket. The name matched a man with a violent criminal past and an arrest record. The promising lead turned into a dead end. The individual passed a polygraph and he was cleared as a suspect. The FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit built a profile of the suspect, a white male who was 25 to 35 years old who was getting sexual gratification from strangulation, Don Johnson, a former inspector for the Detroit Police Department told producers on the show. The strangulation was part of the killer's sexual dysfunction, according to Tracy Benjamin, a retired LAPD investigator. There's some guilt, she said. There's some shame that's associated with the sexual act. Women who encountered the killer and survived turned out to be invaluable witnesses, including a 22-year-old who had been taken to the railroad tracks and attacked. She escaped and told police that he was a white male with red hair who drove a Jeep and wore an Eric name tag. Another victim, Wilhelmina Train, corroborated those descriptions. A week before the bodies were found she'd accepted a ride from a man who took her to the railroad tracks and attacked her. She fought back and escaped. She observed that he had a tattoo of a tiger on his arm. In March 2001, Armstrong's trial for the murder of Wendy Jordan began. The jury returned with a guilty verdict. He was sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. The trial for the murder of Kelly Hood resulted in another life sentence. Armstrong pleaded guilty to second-degree murder for the other killings and he received an additional 31 years in prison. Today Armstrong, 49, continues to serve five sentences for first- and second-degree murder at the Cotton Correctional Facility near Jackson. At this point, we have come to the end of today's stories. May God have mercy on all the victims. I hope you remember them in your prayers. I wish you to have love and peace of mind to be happy in your life. Do not forget to hit the like button so that the video reaches a large number of views.
if this video is worth it. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel. Thank you all.